Hi, I'm Tony, and this is Long Story Short. You know, I mentioned in an earlier video that I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia is a huge city. It's home to one and a half million people spread out over 140 square miles. Philadelphia is an important city too. It generates an estimated 388 billion in GDP each year. It's a major East Coast deep water port, and it's the major population center nestled between the very important cities of Washington DC and New York City, making Philly an important logistical way station. And as the site of the headquarters of Comcast, who will soon own the two high skyscrapers in the city, Philadelphia is also a global telecommunications hub, connecting many people in the United States with the rest of the world. Which is why it would be devastating if a nuclear warhead was detonated over the city. According to a projection from NukeMap, a very clever website created by physics historian Alex Wellerstein that runs simulations on the damage from a nuclear attack, if an 800 kiloton nuclear explosion occurred in the middle of City Hall, there would be 500,000 fatalities in the first 24 hours alone. There would be an additional 867,000 injuries, both from the force of the blast and the radioactive ash which would fall from the sky as the dust settled. Combine that with the massive influx of radiation-related disease over the following years, and the human cost of destroying the city of Philadelphia with a nuclear weapon becomes even higher. So high, in fact, that it surpasses any reason or rationality. Is there any rationality to deploying a weapon as destructive as a nuclear warhead at any time, even during a war? And under what circumstances could a nuclear attack happen on the United States? To answer those questions and more, we have to explore the theory of mutually assured destruction. So, if you're interested in complex international geopolitical military strategies, or just saw this was a video about nukes and thought it was cool, stick around. We're talking about it right now on Long Story Short. Mutually Assured Destruction, or as I'll be referring to it in this video, Mad Theory, is defined by scholars Green and Long as a stalemated balance of power where nuclear adversaries possess survivable retaliatory capabilities that ensure neither side can escape devastation in an all-out nuclear war. To put that another way, both sides of a nuclear conflict have so many nuclear weapons that neither side would be able to completely destroy the other's entire arsenal, thereby allowing the other side to respond with a massive launch of the rest of their stockpile. This would leave both countries as smoldering piles of glow-in-the-dark rubble. It's a pretty scary concept. The thought of one missile launch quickly snowballing into a massive global attack, leaving millions dead and millions more injured. Unfortunately, that's the situation we find ourselves in today. So how did the world get to this point? Well, to figure that out, we have to go all the way back in time to the end of World War II. In the closing months of 1945, the world was shocked by the destruction wrought by the Allied bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with nuclear weapons. The world had not been expecting such a devastating tool of war to make its debut, but once it had, most world leaders immediately understood the implications of possessing multiple weapons which could each destroy a massive swath of land. A paradigm shift had occurred in warfare, and every nation on Earth saw firsthand the consequences of being unprepared for this new method of waging war. Accordingly, a massive arms race erupted between the two major world powers following the conclusion of World War II, the US and the USSR. Both sides started massive nuclear proliferation programs in order to assemble as many nuclear weapons as possible. This mad race to have the most nuclear weapons was only made more frantic by the fact that the USSR had effectively been playing catch up to the US, which had been itself investing billions of dollars into developing nuclear weapons since the end of World War II. In fact, the entire Soviet nuclear program was kickstarted initially by intelligence gathered by Soviet spies on the US nuclear program. Once they overcame the initial hurdle, however, they caught up and fast. 
By the 1960s, the U.S. and the USSR had reached a state of nuclear stalemate, both stockpiling thousands of warheads. These numbers had gone up and down over the years with various anti-nuclear proliferation treaties, but it is estimated that today the United States has about 6,800 nuclear weapons, while Russia has about 7,000. Once these massive quantities of nuclear weapons had been stockpiled in preparation for some sort of offensive maneuvers, both sides then focused on improving their defensive capabilities. Specifically, they invested in developing second strike capabilities. The general idea was for the nuclear state to distribute their nuclear weapons in such a way that the opponent could not possibly eliminate all the warheads in a country in a timely manner. In the event of a nuclear attack on a country, the remaining nuclear weapons would be launched all at once at the aggressor state, causing unacceptably high levels of death and destruction. There were many advancements in nuclear weapon systems which led to the development of Second Strike capabilities. One advancement was the development of the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM. An ICBM is a rocket designed to launch vertically, fly around the world, and deliver a payload to some arbitrary target. Previously, the method for delivering nuclear weapon systems was through the use of specialized long-range bomber aircraft. However, a fast-moving missile is much more difficult to intercept than a slow-moving, physically imposing bomber. Coupled with the fact that the launching silos for ICBMs could be hidden underground in fortified nuclear bunkers designed to survive nuclear Armageddon, the capability for a defeated nation to launch an unknown number of nuclear warheads at the enemy became a very real threat. Another advancement was the invention of nuclear submarines. Nuclear submarines ran on a nuclear generator instead of the noisy and noxious diesel generators which powered early submarines. Since they didn't require a connection to the surface for ventilation, nuclear submarines could go much deeper than previous iterations of submersible craft, and were therefore much more stealthy than any other submarine. Once that was developed, it was only a matter of building a cruise missile launching system and outfitting the missiles with nuclear warheads. Now, a vehicle capable of coming within miles of the coast of a nation undetected with a nuclear payload existed. Since it was highly unlikely that a nation could find and sink the nuclear submarines of the opposing force, this second strike option was extremely effective. So, in case it isn't clear yet, there are a lot of nuclear weapons out there in the world. With so many weapons of mass destruction still ready to be fired at a moment's notice, how likely really is total nuclear annihilation? Well, the violent conclusion of mad theory could be realized in any armed conflict between two nuclear actors. Assuming a conflict between two nuclear states escalates past the condition of conventional warfare, the next logical progression in the force continuum is the deployment of nuclear weapons. And from a purely military standpoint, the tactical use of nuclear weapons makes sense in certain cases. Nuclear weapons are very good at crippling enemy infrastructure and industry, which negatively impacts the war effort. They can also effectively disable command and control nodes, such as high-level officers in the military, which can seriously hamper an enemy country's ability to organize effective resistance. They can also be used to prevent tactically valuable areas from being overrun and occupied by the enemy, or to inflict massive troop casualties on a standing enemy army in the field, when any other course of action short of using a nuclear weapon would probably lead to a loss of the war. In their capacity as weapons designed to disrupt infrastructure, nuclear weapons could be deployed against enemy cities too. This would completely neutralize a city's capacity to participate in the war effort by causing massive destruction to the logistical systems of the city, such as roads, railways, and ports. And the manufacturing centers, such as factories, warehouses, and other locations which store or process materials used in the war effort, would also be destroyed. Most military supplies in the city would either be destroyed outright by the nuclear fireball, or would be rendered unusable by radioactive contamination. While these are the theoretical justifications for detonating a nuclear device in the middle of a major population center, certain and often ostensibly inadvertent outcomes of such an event include gross, indiscriminate loss of civilian life and 
long-term radioactive contamination of the surrounding environment. And while the morality of using nuclear weapons against civilians has been, believe it or not, an ongoing debate since their first use in World War II, the demoralizing effect of a nuclear weapon on the enemy populace cannot be ignored in the context of total war. It is important to keep in mind, however, that the internationally accepted rules of war state that any projected collateral losses of any military action must be proportional to the value of the intended military target. This was one of the justifications for the deployment of the atomic bomb against Japan in 1945. It was said that a land invasion of the Japanese homeland would have cost too many lives on both sides. A quick, easy end of the war was warranted by then Secretary of War Henry Stimson's projections of up to 1.7 to 4 million Allied casualties and 5 to 10 million Japanese casualties. So, yeah, that's rough. With the horrifying prospect of a nuclear firestorm erupting over any city in the world, what factors can we identify which meaningfully contribute to the prevention of nuclear war? Quite paradoxically, mad theory itself, while existing as a metaphorical gun to the head for all of humanity, simultaneously prevents the trigger from being pulled. Mutually assured destruction is a situation known in game theory as Nash Equilibrium. It is a scenario which assumes the following. One, every participant or player has perfect information on the strategies of their opponent. Two, every player picks the best strategy for themselves. Three, no participant has a potential to gain anything by changing their strategy. Four, every player maintains their present strategy and maximizes their potential payoff. Let me explain how this applies to MAD theory. Across the globe, nuclear commanders know that nuclear weapons exist both in their country and in the countries of potential enemies, in a quantity which could lead to a devastating retaliatory nuclear strike. They also know that it is infeasible to destroy the entire supply of enemy nuclear weapons, which means that the initial deployment of nuclear weapons is almost certain to invite a retaliatory strike. Because of this, everybody knows everybody else's strategy. Avoid launching nuclear weapons so as not to invite the opponent to use nuclear weapons against them. Since retaliatory nuclear strikes can, by definition, only occur after an initial offensive detonation, the deployment of nuclear weapons by one side naturally develops into an endgame loss for both participants, where their countries are covered in fire. Since the point of war is to win, not to die, no rational nuclear commander would willingly make the losing move and invite a nuclear attack on their own country, even if it meant the total destruction of the enemy country as well. The tactical victory inherent in the wholesale annihilation of the enemy is made worthless by the destruction of the entity which ordered the strike. Nobody is left to exploit the tactical victory obtained with the nuclear weapons, so the entire point of obtaining the victory in the first place becomes suicidal in its pointlessness. Humanity finds itself in one big Mexican standoff, with everybody pointing guns at everybody else, but nobody stupid enough, at least we hope, to make the first move. An anxiety-inducing situation, sure, but a stable situation as well. And assuming perfectly rational nuclear commanders, a perpetual situation, too. Throughout this video, I've been discussing nuclear states in general terms, without naming any names, so to speak. But you and I live in the real world, and I want to illustrate the current state of nuclear affairs in that world. To do that, I want to compare the nuclear doctrines of two perennial rival superpowers, the Russian Federation and the United States of America. I feel like it is crucial to explore the nuclear doctrines of these countries because it was principally their rivalry during the Cold War which led to the original MAD theory. The following nuclear doctrines are actual results of MAD theory in action, a horrifying and all too real manifestation of these concepts in the present day. Russia has been the preeminent international power, checking the growth of the United States over the last 60 years. They have entered the social consciousness of the United States as a source of existential anxiety with a highly aggressive nuclear program which intersected dangerously with our foreign policy objectives multiple times during the 20th century. 
It is pertinent to examine their nuclear policy closely, if for no other reason than to fully comprehend the reality of another nation having as many nuclear weapons as us. Thankfully, their nuclear weapons doctrine is decidedly defensive. The Kremlin is interested in using nuclear weapons exclusively as tools to preserve both the Russian state and Russian orthodoxy. Patriarch Kirill, religious head of the Russian Orthodox Church, was appointed honorary professor of the Russian Academy of Strategic Nuclear Forces in 2010. He publicly referred to the opening of the Federal Nuclear Center in the city of the Holy Seraphim Sarovsky as God's commandment, and has also often said that nuclear weapons provide sovereignty to Russia. There is a religious basis for the development of nuclear weapons in Russia today due to this clear mandate from the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. Additionally, President Vladimir Putin has noted that Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in a conventional war with extremely high stakes. Essentially, Russia's position on the deployment of nuclear weapons holds that they will only deploy nuclear weapons if it is in a war to preserve their way of life and culture, and losing the war would result in the destruction of Russia. It's my belief that Russia is not keen on using nuclear weapons in an offensive capacity or even threatening the deployment of their weapons. This is a good thing for the international community. Russia has more nuclear weapons than any other state, and they've maintained a bristling and active military since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, most recently annexing the Crimean Peninsula in Ukraine. It is a good thing, then, that they enjoy such an overwhelming conventional superiority that they do not feel the need to deploy nuclear weapons. The nuclear policy of the United States is one of deterrence. The United States, like the rest of the countries in NATO, has not disavowed its privilege to launch a nuclear strike first if the circumstances demand it. This is due to the historical domination of the USSR with regards to conventional warfare over the forces of NATO. The defensive strategy NATO had planned to employ in the case of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe was reducing the invaders to radioactive ash and counterattacking through the fallout. It would have been foolish of the United States to declare its unwillingness to use nuclear weapons because that would have thrown the entire NATO defense plan into disarray. The United States has pledged not to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states, however. With the rise of China and North Korea as nuclear powers developing the capability to strike the United States, some military theorists have advocated shifting the focus of the U.S. nuclear strategy from deterrence through MAD to one of damage limitation. This entails the partial protection of the U.S. from ICBM payloads through various means. One such method is creating a missile screen or some other form of mid-flight missile interception and neutralization. Preemptive strikes on enemy nuclear infrastructure are also necessary to minimize the number of missiles they can launch at all. Additionally, the construction of huge fallout shelters would be necessary to protect the majority of the American population in the event of a heavy fallout. This may not be as good of an idea in practice as it sounds on paper, though. Should the U.S. successfully develop damage limitation strategies, this would affect the ability of other nuclear powers to inflict total annihilation upon us. This may sound good, but it would destabilize the precarious stalemate established by MAD theory, because the U.S. would enjoy a partial safety from a retaliatory nuclear strike. And even then, when it comes to nuclear weapons, partial safety is hardly comforting. So, that's a lot. Knowing what you now know about MAD theory and the movement in the United States advocating our shift from deterrence to damage reduction, I want to know, what do you think? Should the United States shift its policy? Let me know in the comments below. This is pretty grim stuff, but hey, that's our reality. May as well know about it. I'm Tony Pearson. This has been Long Story Short. Thanks for watching. Some interesting stuff, you know, living in our day-to-day -day lives, it can be kind of easy to forget that the, oh, I don't know, powers that be, a lot of them have access to essentially world-ending weapons. You know, it's it's not true that we have a, uh, a stockpile that could, like, destroy the Earth. I know some people used to say, oh, if you dropped seven nuclear warheads or 11 nuclear warheads in 11 key places, you could destroy the world. That's not true. 
Um, our planet is ginormous, and it would take way more than that to, to destroy it. But we have more than enough nuclear weapons to uh, destroy our society for certain, to end life on the planet, um, or at least more complex life. Yeah, we could probably do that to some degree. I'm sure that uh, life is really resilient. Lots of things would probably survive. But anyway, point is, um, if you give the paper by uh, Glazer and Fetter, I believe it was, um, should the United States abandon MAD? If this stuff interests you and you don't mind reading some uh, kind of lengthy academic stuff, I recommend giving that paper a read. It's very interesting. And in it, you find out that uh, it would probably take, if big enough bombs were used, only like 10 to, say, like collapse U.S. society or collapse uh, Russian society. I'm sure that, they're, that the number is slightly different there because it's based on many more factors than just explosive power. Anyway, this stuff is really cool. We didn't even get into talking about the actual Cold War and um, some of the mistakes and stuff that almost happened during then. Maybe we will sometime in the future if you all really like this one. As always, thanks for watching. And by the way, before I go, in case you didn't notice it in the credits, this video is the first video on this channel that wasn't a one-person project. My very longtime friend Julius Toth wrote this episode and researched it as well, which is awesome because it's just a lot of work to uh, research, write, film, and edit these videos every week. So now that I've got another person on board, longer videos like this can be a more frequent target and we can have really nice stuff like uh, proper citations and all of that. So I'm happy to say that he's coming back next week. So again, as usual, thank you for watching. Like this video if you liked it, don't like it if you didn't like it, or even thumb it down if you really didn't like it. And if you want more, subscribe. I come out with one of these every Thursday. Have a nice week, everyone.